Hey there, over the years I have made many mistakes when cooking in the kitchen, so today you're in luck. My loss is your gain. I am going to be showing you the top 15 mistakes that you might be making when cooking in the kitchen. I really hope you could find this helpful. Let's go get started. We're starting today off with a really cool one. So when you have to dice up a bunch of hard boiled eggs for like salads, you know, macaroni salad, egg salad and potato salad, use a cooling rack with square grids. So you first peel the eggs, then press them down through the rack directly into a bowl. This will save you a ton of time chopping up eggs. And then this is like the perfect size eggs for like egg salad, potato salad. It really does work well. I made this mistake when I first got married. I accidentally spilled water on my hot pads and then I went to go take out a casserole that I had in the oven. When I went to take it out, my hands seriously burned. Just because when you wet a hot pad and then try to take something hot out of the oven, it just does not protect your hands. So learn from my mistakes. Don't touch anything with your hot pad if you get them wet. Let's be honest, nobody likes to eat tough chicken, whether that's cooked on the barbecue grill, stovetop, or simply just baked. So I definitely recommend you pounding out your chicken. I know a lot of the time chicken comes like where there's one side of the chicken breast that's a little bit thinner, and then one side is super thick, so then it just cooks unevenly. The thinner side cooks a lot quicker, so then it kind of dries out, and then the bigger side just takes longer to cook. So here is one of my chicken breast that I pounded out. As you see, it is just even in size. And then here is the other chicken breast that I haven't pounded out yet. One side is a lot thinner than the other side. So I'm just going to pound out that second chicken breast right now. And when I first started cooking, I couldn't figure out why my chicken was always so dry and I just didn't do a very good job at cooking it however I would cook it. But over time, I've learned pounding out your chicken really helps just because it also helps the seasonings stick to the meat and then you will avoid dryness and then it will just be super duper tender. Everybody will love it. I'll be the first to admit I actually don't pound out my chicken breasts every single time I cook with chicken. A lot of the time I just slice my chicken breasts in half horizontally just like this. If you've seen any of my other cooking videos, you've probably seen me do this by now. The reason why I like doing this is because of course it speeds up the cooking time. Also it breaks down the muscle fibers into kind of like smaller sections, making the chicken a lot easier to chew, so therefore it will be nice and tender in the end. So if you don't want to pound out your chicken, I definitely suggest you slicing it thin like this. It's a great alternative. Another trick that I like to do is I like to add butter and oil to my pan when I cook my chicken or my different meats on the stove. This way it's kind of like the best of both worlds. It adds a ton of flavor and then it makes the chicken extra juicy and it almost adds kind of like a creamy taste. So I definitely suggest you cooking with butter and oil when cooking your meats. I like to do like half and half. So a half a tablespoon of butter and a half a tablespoon of oil. Here's another tip for you. I only like to flip my meats once normally when I'm cooking them on the stove. They will be super juicy in the center and then the outside it will kind of form like a crust almost like crunchy so the outside will be nice and crispy and then the center of the meat will be perfectly juicy. I definitely suggest you doing that. It really is easy to overcook and undercook meats, especially chicken, so I do suggest you getting a good digital thermometer. I got mine off of Amazon. It was right around $25, so I'll link it for you guys, but I definitely recommend a good thermometer. It really is game changer just because that way you could keep your meat juicy without undercooking it and then without overcooking it. I definitely recommend you searing your meat before you add it to your slow cooker. So add your high temperature oil into a pan. I used canola oil. Turn your heat to a higher heat and then add your meat in there. I'm using chuck roast today just because I made my family roast for dinner on that night. I seasoned it on both sides with a dash of salt and pepper and cook this on a higher heat for a few minutes on each side until it kind of looks caramelized on the outside. This will give your roast so much added flavor. 
kind of like a caramelized flavor and then it'll also improve the meat's texture deglazing the pan afterwards and then adding the drippings into the slow cooker adds another layer of intense delicious flavor so to deglaze my pan i just added a cup of beef broth in there i whisked it for a few minutes until i got all of the delicious bits off the bottom of my pan then i added my roast and the drippings into my slow cooker and then i added the rest of the ingredients in and I do want to let you know, I don't sear my meat every single time I add it into my slow cooker. If you've seen any of my slow cooking videos, you probably know I have a couple kids and I simply don't have time to sear my meat on certain days. And that's totally okay if you don't have time to sear your meat too. When you go and cook dry beans, I definitely suggest you soaking them in a large bowl of cold water overnight. This will help your beans cook faster and more evenly. Also, this will make your beans easier to digest. When you're soaking them overnight, add in a tablespoon of salt. The salt will help break down their skin, so then the beans will be super creamy and soft in the end, and their skins won't be tough at all. And then the next day when you cook your beans, just drain the water that the beans were soaking in add in all of your seasonings and cook up those beans and then once they are through cooking you will see your beans are super soft and delicious this goes for cooking them on the stove in the slow cooker and in the instant pot Another thing that I like doing is I like to add in my oil after my pan is hot and then once the oil is hot I like to add in my vegetables or my meat really whatever I am cooking. Do you hear that sizzle? That is the sound you want to hear when you add in your foods. And then the reason why I like to do this is because it helps seal in the flavor. It helps the food not stick to the bottom of the pan and most importantly it helps your vegetables brown evenly on the outside and become the most tender on the inside. I never use a spatula anymore to separate meat when cooking it on the stove. I always use my meat masher to mash up my ground beef, ground turkey, and ground chicken. It just separates the meat the best in my opinion. And then once your meat is cooked through, there's always a lot of grease left in the pan. And my mom taught me this trick years ago. She said, don't ever put your grease down the drain. Don't go put it in a trash can. Always soak up your grease with a paper towel and and a spatula just like this and I have been using this trick for years it really does work the best and I am just so thankful my mom taught me this trick when I was growing up when making a dinner and you think to yourself this might need more salt or you try it and you just think it needs more salt but you already added salt in don't add any more salt in sometimes it needs a little hint of like some type of acid so like lime juice lemon juice or a little bit of vinegar will go a long way so to this dish i'm just adding in one lime juice and then it will actually enhance the flavor of the food similarly to adding salt without adding any additional sodium so this little trick works super well now I'm going to show you how I keep my berries fresh in my fridge for up to 10 days. I have a large bowl of cold water right here. To the water, I added in a fourth a cup of regular vinegar and about three tablespoons of baking soda. Give this a really good whisk. And then after I get home from the store, I like to try to do this the same day. Just add the berries into the bowl of water and then just let this sit for about five to 10 minutes. I do stir it occasionally while it's in there. You know just so the berries get a good mix and then if you don't want to do this with strawberries or you just don't have strawberries on hand or you don't buy them you could also do this with grapes or really any other types of fruits that you buy at your grocery store and the reason why I like to do this so much is because the simple solution of the vinegar and the baking soda destroys the bacteria and the mold spores and then the mold and the bacteria that is really what causes like the berries to go bad eventually so if if you kill those mold spores then your berries will stay fresh super long but after my berries were done sitting there I just rinsed them off in my strainer now I'm going to pat the berries dry with this cloth right here and this is what the bowl looked like after I dumped out the berries as you could see there is some dirt in there which is kind of gross this is just what was left over in the bowl and that's kind of a lot of dirt for those berries and then I have these fruit prep containers right here and if you don't have prep containers you could just put the berries after they're dry in a Tupperware container lined with paper towels. 
My girls absolutely love boxes of macaroni and cheese for lunch. Who doesn't? So a few months ago, I was thinking to myself, how can I make a better homemade version of a box of macaroni and cheese for cheaper? And so I kind of made this recipe up. You're going to want to add about a cup and a half of pasta to a pot of boiling water, cook it up according to the box instructions, and then drain it. Next, you're going to want to make a really simple, easy flour slurry. All it is is a a tablespoon of all-purpose flour and about two tablespoons of milk. Mix this together super well so it is no longer clumpy. Add it into the cooked pasta and then you're also going to want to add in your real cheese. So I'm just using a cup and a half of shredded cheddar cheese. I shredded the cheese by myself but you could use pre-shredded cheese if you'd like to as well. Then add in a little bit of salt and pepper and give this a stir. You are going to watch this transform into the most beautiful homemade macaroni and cheese ever. This is so easy to make. It is as easy as making a box of macaroni and cheese on this stove and we absolutely love this little macaroni and cheese hack. This is a great little kitchen hack. This mac and cheese comes together in no time at all. You don't want to miss next week's video so make sure you're subscribed down below the video. I'll see you there. Bye for now.